थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ सो वेलकम एवरी वन इट्स वंडरफुल टू बी होस्टिंग द वेरी फर्स्ट वेव्स वेबिनार ऑफ दिस ईयर uh waves is as all of you know women of apoa uh, advocate educate and support and uh, our mission is to really create opportunities for women across the asia pacific uh to highlight uh, their achievements to make them come closer and network for a much better supportive environment for women in orthopedics and also to uh, spread awareness uh, to uh, you know give each other uh, the very required championing boost that is needed and eventually to see all of them uh, progress Uh, which means that we're talking about sixty thousand, uh, a base of sixty thousand plus orthopedic surgeons, and uh, various countries with various diverse cultural backgrounds. Uh, this webinar, this International Women's Day, we thought it was very very important to get two luminaries in their fields, uh, both who have been women who have been super achievers. they have uh, excelled in their profession and also gone beyond the call of duty and have uh, you know kind of uh, brought to us uh, something which would uh, enhance our own experience and uh, we have much to learn from both of them so without much ado let me uh, begin this uh, webinar today um we have two very very eminent speakers i hope my uh, screen is visible yes is my screen visible to everyone yes yes ma'am yes so we have dr shalima abdullah from malaysia and ms ani arnett from australia who will be talking for 20 minutes each um and we will be asking them a whole lot of questions based on their experience if you have any questions for all those who are tuned in please do type in uh, in the youtube link which is from ortho tv or just log on to the ortho tv channel and then go on to youtube put your question in the comment section and we should be able to relay them to our uh, speakers here after the lovely two uh, speeches by both of our eminent speakers we are going to have a very enlightened panel discussion by four young very driven women from the asia pacific country on a panel uh, one of them who is the winner of the waves apoa sa contest she's stood second and uh, the other three my uh, council members that is uh, dr chasnal and sema will introduce and that will be moderated by ml gonen from turkey i will be introducing dr shalima the first speaker and uh, Anatolian will be introducing up she was a P elect she will be introducing a second speaker that is Ms Annie Arnett uh Dr Chalimar is a hand surgeon and senior lecturer in hand and microsurgery uh from the university in Kuala Lumpur she got her medical degree and a bachelor of medical sciences from the university of nottingham england in 1998 uh she then qualified in orthopedic surgery uh, further in 2005 and did a sub specialization in hand surgery in 2007 she also has a fellowship in hand surgery from the very very prestigious kleinert institute louisville usa and she has been uh, you know her heart really is in this work besides being a hand surgeon that she's been associated with an international humanitarian ngo named mercy malaysia since 1998 of which she is currently the vice president 3 she has served in many crises in malaysia bangladesh afghanistan pakistan japan indonesia myanmar cambodia and the philippines and she is also the team lead for the emt or the emergency medical team she has huge experience in disasters like earthquakes and typhoons and she's played a very active role in the covid pandemic and we thought it was very apt to bring her uh, here on board and have her share her experiences especially in the wake of the crisis in uh, turkey at 
you know, at present. So I'll stop share here and a very warm welcome to uh, Dr. Shalimar and let's have her slides going on now. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you very much to everyone, especially Dr. Rujuta. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for this uh, session. Um, and I'm very honored for this. Uh, I'm uh, bit, I apologize that I'm not able to, to play my slide by myself because I've got some issues with my screen. Um, and so Dr. Rujuta has kindly um, been able to download my presentation and play it from her um, from her computer. Right, so um, I'm going to go quite fast on this because basically I just want to share my experience and uh, and there's lots of pictures. There's about um, um, 100 slides over here, but I'll just go very quickly. All right, um, uh, next slide, please, Dr. Rujuta. Right, so these are, these are the experience I'm going to talk about in Afghanistan, in Pakistan, Philippines, Nepal, and just a very short one on the uh, the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Next slide. Uh, so throughout these experiences, I had a lot of interpersonal reflection um, and also evaluate my own personal values and motivation and also some prejudice views that we normally have. Next slide. Um, so this was in Afghanistan. Next. So this is a, an example of a complex disaster post-war, which is ongoing. It's, it's just very chronic. So I was uh, sent to um, a place called Spin Buddha, which is at the border of Pakistan. Next slide. And we would stay in Pakistan because in Pakistan it's more peaceful. And then every day we would go over to Spin Buddha to do our medical work and we return. Next slide. And we were working together with the uh, Pakistan uh, Islamic Medical Association. Uh, next slide. So in Afghanistan, one of the, this is the preconceived ideas that we have. All these people were turban and bearded men and all these burqa clad women, but and, and they are Muslim, but then actually none of them knew how to read the Quran or pray. So we from Malaysia, we are more, perhaps you would say more religious, but we didn't look religious. For And they look religious, but they were not religious. Not because they are not, but because they were not educated. They, they were all very poor. None of them go to school. So this was the one of the preconceived ideas that we normally have, and it was... Um, actually um, uh, showed that I was wrong. Okay, next. And then this was the, the, in the border to Afghanistan. It's all men. You don't see women at all. Next slide. And then um, this was one of my uh, colleagues seeing patients with the translator. Next slide. Um, this was some of the surgery that we had to do. And in Afghanistan, there was... Uh, you know, the, the sutures are not attached to the needle. You have to thread in your suture into the needle and, and suture it manually. So that was quite an experience for me. Next slide. And, and, and that was the problem that the patients would have is they say, oh, I want more children. And I'll be like, okay, do you have any children? And they say, yeah, we've got five. I've got five. And I say, oh, you want more? And they say, yeah, because my neighbors have 10 children and I only have five. So I want more children. And to them, that's like a big problem, uh, which to us would be, oh, okay, you already have five. That's, that's enough. So, so this was all the things that um, uh, prejudices that I, I have to relearn. Okay, next slide. And the people, um, they were actually one of the warmest people. They look very, they look very um, stern and very scary. But actually, once you get to know them, they were really nice people. Next slide. Okay, and, and then I move on to uh, Bagh in Pakistan. This was another earthquake. This was in two, uh, 2005. Next slide. And going to these areas, it from Malaysia to uh, to uh, Muzaffarabad, it took us nearly two days just to arrive. So I'm just saying, if if we want to be involved in disaster response, um, um, there's a lot of 
time that people have to expand like two weeks, three weeks to, to do work like this. Next slide. Okay, so the, an earthquake occurred during Ramadan. Next. And because it was at night, um, it's like in Turkey, a lot of people died. There was 80,000 deaths. For the Turkey earthquake, it's 40,000. Next slide. All right, next. Just to show the devastation. Next. And um, next. And people were still finding bodies. Next. And um, just to see how sad it was for the uh, villages to have to stay in tents. Next. And um, having to use the field as a helipad to send patients from the mountains to the city for treatment. Next slide. So what we did was uh, we uh, set up a field hospital, which was uh, from a tented um from tents from the Spanish Civil Defense Unit. Next slide. So actually you can see a green building in the background, but uh, that is the current standing hospital, but it was damaged in the earthquake and it's dangerous. So people, we would go in to take med medication and run out from there um, and then work in the, in the tents. Next. So as, as you can see, it's very primitive and the ward is mixed, male and female. Okay, next. And um, at the beginning, because it was difficult to bring supplies, we had to use very simple stuff, just even like this, using rocks next for traction. And then um, well, just uh, the nurses doing suture removal next. And uh, this was a patient for debridement. There was lots of patients for debridement next. Uh, yeah, you can see the sterilization is just double boiling, which um, uh it may not be so great okay next slide um yeah yeah well Kind Sorry, of... I, am I, I'm back. Is this okay? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, uh, you can just go to the next slide now. Okay, next. Just to show how um, difficult it was at the beginning of the disaster. Uh, next. Yeah, and this was a child under sedation for just an open fracture, radius ulna. Next. And we were just doing a debridement. Next. Um, this one was we were attempting to do an external fixator, which um, I think was not very good in that situation. Uh, next. And uh, the sedation was all ketamine because the GA machine was not working. Okay, next slide. Yep. Okay, next. Next. This is just a patient with an anal tear. Next slide. And then uh, toilet and suturing done. Next slide. Again, this was at the beginning. Later on, when more um, supplies arrived, then we, we were able to be more um, sterile. Next slide. Okay, next slide. This was a, a quite a sad case of amputation of a crushed left hand. Next. So this was already done by another uh, team. So we just carried on with debridement of above elbow amputation. Again, under sedation. Next slide. And just to say that, um, you know, it's just not medical things happening. There was also other things going on. Next slide. Um, yeah. So, um, next slide. Um, okay. This uh, What we also noted that there was a lot of Unwanted, you know, when people talk about disaster, the first thing people want to do is to donate clothes, donate food and all that. Next slide. But it it, it tends to be a, a logistical nightmare. So this is what happened to all the clothes that people were donating. They, they think that they are doing something good, but the clothes were just thrown and on the roads and they just became garbage. Next. 
next yeah clothes shoes all these became garbage this is in hurricane katrina in in the us um right okay next even food is also not encouraged because it, they have expiry date okay next so the best thing to donate i would say is money to local or international humanitarian organization this will allow them to buy in bulk at cheaper prices and all the items will have a, a substantial expiry date it will help the local economy and the item bought will be acceptable in the cultural context so these are important things next okay next so next i just move on to um philippines for typhoon haiyan next slide um this was the devastation in tacloban next so i was uh, based in ormok district hospital next so half of the hospital the roof was blown away so but half of the hospital was still standing but we built up our base around the um, original hospital mm -hmm. and uh, next slide we also have a technical team who helped to rebuild the hospital okay next so not only is our team medical, but we also have technical as well. Okay, next slide. Right, next. Next. So rebuilding the hospital was actually a big thing as well. Next slide. Um, uh, next. Okay, next. Just to show the um, operating theater. Next slide. Um, Dr. Rajuta is frozen again, but what this is one example where I had a lot of problems because um, the hospital was packed with patients with fractures of the lower limb, but the fractures were actually due to MVA, not exactly due to the typhoon, but these patients were all filling up the wards. So the hospital director, she knew that I was an orthopedic surgeon, so she said, hey, you should do surgery on this patient so that you can... Um, we can clear the ward, but I was not comfortable with the sterile um, environment over there. So um, um, this was a big dilemma for me. Should I convert a closed fracture into an open fracture? We know that closed fractures, uh, they're not infected. You know, if, if there is no issues with it, you can put full length POP and it's fine. But in many cases, there were shortening um and um and or angulation which if you leave then the patient will have a short limb so ah uh, um uh okay sorry uh, dr juta can you move on to the next slide right oh yeah uh, with regards to the rebuilding um we were criticized for using the same materials um People were saying that you should not use the same materials because if there's another typhoon, it's going to get worse again. I mean, it's going to be blown away again. But on the other hand, if you wanted to wait for superior materials, you need more money and you need to wait for two to three months for the materials to come. In the meantime, patients don't have a hospital to go to. So this was also a dilemma for my NGO. Next slide. Uh, next just to show how many patients, we had like 300 patients a day. Next slide. Um, uh, next. And you see, if you have 300 patients in your normal air-conditioned clinic, it's fine. But when you have 300 patients in a hot tent, or you after two hours, you're already irritable and tired. So this was also another thing for people who want to do uh, disaster work. They have to be very, very... Um, um, hardy against all these challenges. Next. 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 Okay, so this was the part I was talking about, the orthopedic problem. The uh, Because the hospital director wanted me to um, clear the wards of patients with lower limb fractures. So she wanted me to operate on the patients. Next slide. But if, if you see the picture of of the OT, you know, I wasn't comfortable to do internal fixation. Of course, for obvious cases like this, we carry on. Next slide. But for closed fractures, next slide. 
Um, because theoretically, you should only perform ORIF if you have a safe water supply, a very sterile OT, um, physiotherapy, all this co-location, because they just dump all the patients in the same ward at, at that time. Next slide. Um, next. So I thought about it for a long time, but then when I, I asked about I asked the orthopedic surgeon who was there, he had um, his family was uh, missing, so that's why he was not able to work. But he said, this is normal. This is what we normally do. We still do operate in this condition. Next slide. And so I, I had to, I still carried on and did uh, about 10 cases of um, internal fixation. Next slide. Right. Okay. Next. Yeah. This is just to show the dilemma that we had, and and also the other thing, there was no GA machine, so we could only do spinal oscillation. Next slide. Yeah. And and yeah, like this, there was air conditioning with direct communication, so I I wasn't happy to do, uh, the ORIF. Next slide. Right. And yeah, also to use a construction drill, it was my first time. Next slide. Maybe some of you orthopedic surgeons have done that, but for me, it was the first time. But yeah, it was possible to use just a construction drill for the X fix. Next slide. And we did a delta frame. Next slide. Yeah, okay, next. All right, and, and this is also another case where I call it a mission creep because again, this was a patient who was burnt, um, nothing to do with the typhoon, but the parents said that nobody else will do surgery or nobody else knows how to do surgery on this child, on my three-year-old child, they said. So please, please, can you do surgery on this, on this child? So she, he had a knee contracture and elbow contracture and therefore he could not walk and he could not use his, his right upper limb at all. Next slide. So I've, again, I'm just thinking, I said, okay, I'll do it. So I did a contracture release. Next slide. Uh, but I had to do it in a stage uh, uh, procedure. So I went to Philippines about five times in six months uh, just to do this child. Next slide. So I did a uh, knee contracture release, ankle, and also wrist uh, contracture release. Next slide. So um, I think, Dr. Ruta, you can go right up to the end because um, I'm running out of time. Just the last few slides. Just These are all just more experiences. Just the last... The, the conclusion slides. All right, okay. Yeah, so number one, I think um, the other thing is that, you know, we only think about the crisis that we hear in the media. The media is very powerful. Actually, if you look at this map, all these places have crisis, but we, we don't even know. Okay, for now, we are all thinking about Turkey, right? Because that's the one which is in the media. But in the middle part of Africa, there's crisis all the time. So humanitarian work actually is all the time ongoing everywhere in the world. Next slide. Um, and then the other thing is to say that it was a very humbling experience for me to be involved in disaster work. We take for granted all that we have while many people don't have anything. So I feel it's our responsibility to help other people. Next. And that um, sometimes I felt like I, was do I wasn't doing much because... Because when you go for disaster work, you don't have the backup facilities that you're so used to. You can't even... You may or may not be able to do an x-ray. You may or may not be able to take blood, even full blood count and all that. So sometimes I was just giving painkillers and vitamin C and I felt that, oh, useless. Why did I fly all the way to Afghanistan just to give vitamin C? But the patient said, look, what's important is that you came to try and help us and we will remember that. So they said, like, come again in one year when we have rebuilt our houses and we welcome you. So for the patient, it was so important that Somebody in the world is thinking about that, about them. Next. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, uh, all my slides look, look very nice because I'm going overseas to help other people. But, you know, you don't have to do all that. You can just do it in your own hospital where you have a lot of unfortunate people. And, and that is also a big thing. And I'm sure all of us do that. Um, okay, next slide. Yeah, so so I, this, 
just what I want to say. I, I want to say um, thank you also to Mercy Malaysia, which is the NGO that I'm with for giving me the opportunity to, to volunteer in this type of situation. And um, yeah, I, I, I hope um, all of you benefit from my experience. Um, I think we, we have five minutes for questions. Yes, that was really a very, very wonderful talk, Dr. Sh uh, Shalimar. And I'm sorry for the internet issues that I had, but I'm in another place. So the connectivity got the better of me. A um, couple of questions uh, from my side and any, anybody from the council who do they want to ask. Um, I, I think disasters all over the world uh, are really, you know, something we know that will keep happening. So how important do you think it is to have a task force in each country to be trained internally as well as to be trained to go outside because mm. the situations may be different? Mm. Right. So um, WHO has an initiative called the EMT or Emergency Medical Team Initiative. So what they do is they, they want to make sure that all the teams who actually go out, they are self-sufficient and they have a certain standard because sometimes in humanitarian work, a lot of people feel, oh, okay, just because it's a disaster, the standards doesn't need to be, that the standards are lower, but actually that's wrong. We should adhere to the standards that is uh, uh, of a, a international level. So WHO, has this EMT for the local country uh, and international. So for local, the standard is for that country and for international is to go overseas. So how important, I, I think it's very important um, in certain countries, for example, Indonesia, I'm sure uh, Dr. Azeta knows that every, every six months, they're going to have a disaster. So they will have an, uh, their local um, medical teams ready to go and um, they know what the people need and the cultural differences and language and all that. And for international, it's a different level of, um, of medical teams. Um, I, I think in, in Turkey, Mercy Malaysia, we, we went there, but the, the thing in Turkey was they only wanted accredited medical teams. So uh, Mercy Malaysia is we are undergoing the accreditation process, but we are not accredited yet. So we were not able to enter Turkey. And they also wanted uh, people with Turkish medical license, but that's because Turkey is uh, an advanced uh, country, of course. So, um, yeah. And uh, Emel has a question she would like to ask. Emel, you can unmute and go ahead. Um, yeah, I, I think she's written on, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shalomar. Yeah. Uh, do you think is there any, uh, any action that orthopedic societies, especially women orthopedic societies, can take uh, to support the victims uh, or, and make an impact uh, in such disasters? Um, thank you for the question. Since we lately uh, also get a horrible earthquake lately. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think um, what we can do is to to have the APOA surgeons join an NGO or an organization with, which already have a medical team because it's not only the surgeons. As you saw in my pictures, logistics is a big thing. Interconnecting with the World Health Organization is a big thing. So if, we, if APOA wanted to prepare surgeons, they should send the surgeons to another NGO or institute to undergo training mission training, field training, all sorts of training. Uh, because as you saw in my pictures, you know, um, it's not so easy to do humanitarian work in an environment that you're not used to. And the second thing, you have to be experienced enough. Sometimes the people who want to go are the young people without experience. The older people with experience, they don't want to go because, you know, it's going to be a lot. You have to sleep in a tent and this and that. But it's the older people who should go because they have the experience. But nowadays with Zoom and all this, you know, you can still send younger surgeons who can discuss with older surgeons. 
um yeah so what can apoa do is to um send their interested surgeons to other organization msf for example medicines on frontier is is a very good organization that that they can train people so i was actually about to ask annette because uh, she also has considerable experience in disaster um, so, I mean, what, what salient points do you think uh, we can pick up from Dr. Shalimar's talk, Annette? Oh, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk, Dr. Shalimar. I wish I could hear the whole talk, <laughs> perhaps another time, yeah. because um, I recognise some of the places you have been, um, in particular Afghanistan and um, there was, wasn't it Spinboldak and um, the Philippines. As... Um, I think one of the important things as well that we haven't just discussed, because I think it is very important to be linked to organisations who already have logistic support rather than going as a, a single responder and that your whole team's trained, is yeah. about, um, I think, training people to do the right sort of surgery. Like if someone was trying to get you to do the internal fixation but you recognise the conditions weren't right, I think there's a lot of surgeons who wouldn't appreciate that, who would just think you can do the operation and um, not expecting that everything will get infected because Haiti really showed the world that that there was a lot of internal fixation done and and most of it got infected if done early. So it and is a problem. Um, does, and I just wondered, does Malaysia have its own EMT too that's verified with the WHO? Uh, no, um, I, Mercy Malaysia is, we are undergoing the verification for type 1 next week. And then maybe in another year, we'll be ready for type 2. But uh, we are still type 1. Okay, it's lovely. Australia's got an EMT type 2. And so certainly for our country, um, linking to, we've got a National Critical Care Trauma Response Centre based in Darwin, being trained through that. And, and going as part of that organisation is very important. I quite agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think APOA, if, if you want to send your surgeons, you should ask them to maybe join the Australian EMT or, or any other EMT type 2. Or actually you can have a special, they call it a specialised cell. I mean, it's just orthopaedic. I mean, they will just go with their orthopaedic equipment. For the EMT type 1 and type 2, you're supposed to see other patients like obstetrics and gynae, um, um, uh, people with hypertension, diabetes and all that. But you can have a special cell uh, which is going to be based in another hospital and it could be an orthopedic cell. So that could be something that APOA might want to, might want to look into. All right, I think it's been fantastic and I'm sure we would have many, many questions uh, to ask her. So uh, my only request before we go on to our next very wonderful speaker is uh, if you could share in a nutshell, you know, the take home messages from your talk to us and we would like to uh, you know, distribute it to the APOA waves or maybe give us a short write up and, you know, we could do that uh, through the APOA connection as well. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your wonderful experiences. And I think mo what I've learned most is to remain and stay humble through the whole thing. And I, I, I will definitely hold that in my heart from what I heard today. Yeah. Um, may I uh, now request An um, Annette to, uh, I'm sorry, I'll stop this share and I'll go on to the other one, to introduce our next speaker. And the very wonderful uh, uh, is, is that Annie seen? Arnett. Yes, Annie Arnett. Is that seen my screen? We've got Shelly, Dr. Shalimar up at the moment, so oh, just advance sorry. one. That's all right. Thank you. Where are you going, Pussycat? With hotel connection, so just a bit of a lag over there. Can I put this now full screen? Is that seen very well? Oops. Thank right. you. All right. Okay, so I'd like to, um, my name's Annette Holly and I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Australia and the immediate past president of the AOA, but I'm introducing um, this evening Annie Arnett. Annie's career has spanned over two decades in the healthcare consumer industry, holding sales and marketing roles with global and regional leadership scope at Kimberly-Clark 
Hologic, Stryker and Arthrex in both Australia, New Zealand and the USA. Annie holds a Bachelor of Science and a Master's of Business. Marketing, communications, product launches, stakeholder relationships and challenging business problems are keen interests. Annie has held a board position at the Medical Device Industry Association, MTAA, advancing the industry strategies and access to the patients it serves. Annie joined Arthrex in late 2020 as the General Manager for Australia and New Zealand, bringing Annie back into orthopaedics. She's passionate about medical devices, innovation and the healthcare industry. Advancing women's health and women in leadership have become a big part of her leadership and joining the Mentor Walks Mentors and her role at Arthrex allows her to invest in these passions. Thank you, Annie. Annie's going to screen share and get her presentation from her computer. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Annie, it's all yours. Take the floor. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm uh, hoping you can see my screen now. Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rajuta and uh, Dr. Holly, and and also a thank you to to Dr. Burgess who initially invited me to join. Um, I agree with you, Dr. Rajuta. It's very humbling. Um, to be to be part of this group and also to hear uh, Dr. Fimilla's um, presentation. Um, and, and thank you very much for having me. I have a, a great respect uh, for the talented women uh, in the audience and what for what you do each and every day. Uh, and it's amazing for me and my organization to to be part of this industry. Um, I'm talking on a topic today about um, a little bit about my career and giving you a little bit of a different uh, aspect in, in coming from the medical device world, which partners in with what you do each and every every day. And so I wanted to start with a with a slide, um, and I'm sure you can all um, resonate with uh, with this in that we all play different roles. And this is really important for me um, when I think about the roles that we switch in and out of um, through our day and through our, our week. Uh, and through our year, and I identify with a lot of these roles, and maybe a, maybe a few more um, in any given day. Um, but it's something that's important to me because I we do get pulled in all sorts of different directions, and it's important um, to know what are the priorities um, for any given time. And being in the moment for me is is very critical to be able to give my most to to each and every one of these roles that I I play. Um, and I like to give back in in the ways that I I can and and make time for, for each of these roles that I play each and every day. I wanted to give you a little bit about my, my story and, and where I have come from. So during school, um, I actually wanted to be a competitive gymnast. I was a competitive uh, gymnast and I didn't quite make it to the top. Australia isn't strong in gymnastics as a sport in total. Um, I made it to the national championships here and, and that's all I wanted to do was, was be a champion gymnast. But um, as you may know, for, for female gymnastics, it, 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 you sort of your career ends at about 16, uh, 17. It's getting a little bit longer now um, for, for some gymnasts, but um, that was about the end of my career. And so I switched to, to think about what I was going to do in the future. And all I wanted to do was be a physiotherapist um, and be part of a sporting team that I could, I could be a physiotherapist. But unfortunately, at the time, I actually couldn't afford to live away from home to go to university. And so I was living in Canberra at the, at the time. Um, my, my mother is an operating room nurse um, and my, my dad was in the army. Um, and so I stayed at home and studied science. I thought I would do I'd do a science degree um, and that could lead me to wherever I wanted to go at a later point and hopefully that would be physiotherapy. But I actually fell in love with molecular biology when I was doing my degree. Um, and so I actually am a molecular biologist but have not really used it uh, that much other than being when I was at Hologic for a couple of years actually launching some, some COVID tests into the marketplace when, when that crisis hit the globe. Um, but molecular biology, I loved the theory of it, but working practically was not something that um, that I was enjoying. Um, and so I actually went back and got my master's in, in business um, and landed in the medical device industry at, at Kimberly Clark. Um, and then have worked my way into the orthopedics uh, area in, in both sales and marketing roles. Um, and that has led to me to, um, to where I am today. Um, and I can give you a little bit of an understanding of, of where that's um, led um, in my opportunities that I've actually had. And one of those was to take a risk and actually go overseas um, and share my experience and step right out of my comfort zone in a market that I knew and relationships that I had. 
and step over into the US, which was headquarters for the organisation I worked for and completely out of my comfort zone. And so I wanted to share with you um, some of the uh, learnings that I learned on going on that journey uh, of stepping outside my comfort zone and what I've learned being part of a global uh, organisation as I've, I've moved through my career. Uh, and these are some of the, the takeaways that I've learned along my, my journey. Uh, each and every day. And one of those is to take the opportunities and if not, create the opportunities. Um, it was something that I, I realised that staying in Australia and working for a big multinational organisation where all the decisions are made are actually over in the, the head office. And so I created the opportunity to, to head over and, and had to interview and win a position in the global headquarters. Um, and I, I did that. Um, there was a huge amount of risk to it. I moved my family, my, my husband and my four-year-old daughter, who, who now has a lovely uh, Southwest Michigan accent uh, across the globe uh, at the age of four. Uh, so that five-year opportunity was absolutely amazing, but there was a huge amount of risk. There was visa risk. Um, there was the risk that I might not enjoy it, that my family wouldn't enjoy it. Um, but that was something that I created, but also took advantage of an opportunity that, um, that I wanted to create and be part of. One of the big things for me is authenticity and integrity. Uh, and this has been um, something that has kept me grounded through my career. And many people have taught me along the way is to know who you are and keep true to that. Um, and people will respect and, and be on your journey with you. Um, find mentors and sponsors. And, and this is something that I've done. Um, and it took me a little while, probably about five to six years to, to really figure out and create a mentor base of people that could support me. Um, and this is something that, um, that I'm trying to do in giving back now to create that base for, for others to be able to rise um, to what they would like to do in their careers. Um, know your value and your why and build on your difference. And that's one of the things that, that I really found is, is being a female at a lot of tables that I was the only female and a lot of forums where I, where I was the only female is I was grounded to what I wanted to do and, and where my voice was and where my value was and sharing that in the most appropriate way has really put me in, in good stead. Um, I, I realised this, someone told me, and it took me actually by a little bit of surprise that someone actually said to me that I was a role model for them. Um, and that was a humbling experience because I said, I'm still trying to figure it out myself. How could I, I be a role model for, for others? Um, and that actually gave me a huge amount of responsibility and realisation as to um, what I could do for, for others. And others were actually watching what I was, what I was doing. Um, and many people have come up to me over the years and said, if Annie can do it, then I can do it. And, and um, that was very humbling for me and something that I'm, I'm very privileged and very conscious of as I as I go about my work each, each day. Um, I've observed and learned what to do, but I've also learned what not to do. I've had some really great bosses and, and really great leaders in my career, and I've learned a lot of what you should do to, um, to be of value. Um, but I've also learned what not to do, and I think that's really important, and I've learned probably more what not to do, um, especially in creating diversity at the table and how to bring up topics in a way that they will land um, and be taken forward, and that's that's something that I've definitely learned um, what not to do with the way others have presented. Um, I do give back. Um, it's something that took me a little while to be able to give back, and I am part of the mentor walks, and I try to do as many charity walks as I can. That helps me with my fitness as well as giving back, so I do the breast cancer walks, um, and I, I'm actually doing, um, there's one here called Manly Moles, which is for skin cancer. Um, that I'm doing in a couple of weeks. So I do try to give back to the community where I can. But I am part of the Mentor Walks Association, which is actually um, just starting to grow in Asia Pacific. They've got a branch in Singapore. They've got a branch in uh, New Zealand and in many cities across Australia, and they're growing. Um, and this is where I'm actually a mentor with many other leading females in many across many different industries. And they partner you with mentees and you just go for a walk with them once a month at, at seven o'clock in the morning, we meet and we just go for a walk and, and um, they can share experiences or questions they have in their career or experiences they're going through and get some guidance in a, in a non-threatening environment. Uh, and that's something that gives me, gives me a lot of pleasure to be involved with. Um, supporting others and networking, it, it's something that um, you have to spend time doing um, and using your network that's that's out there. I learned that from my husband each and every day. He's the master networker um, and to be able to create that network um, to um, support others. 
And I think the biggest lesson for me, and I'm still trying to learn this, is even with the hard days, is laugh and enjoy it um, and really enjoy what you're doing and, um, and that will be uh, fruits of your, of your journey. Um, but encounters along the way, and I, I've, had, I've had many challenges and many embarrassing um, things that have happened to me along the way, and I've, I've also had um, situations where I've been asked to, um, to leave the room and let the boys talk about it and, and things like that, and, and I've, I've worked out a way to, to manage those, but I definitely have encountered these across my, uh, um, my career, especially in a male-dominated industry. But one of the things that I learned is to feel the pulse, have that network and understand what's going on, know your environment, know who the players are and who the people are and have people that you can go to to really understand what's going on. And what I found is doing the pre-work really does help you get an idea up or, or channel a, a way that you want to move uh, or progress something. Um, I have been the, the only female in many um, situations and I own it. Um, and people will say, oh, you're the only one here. And I say, yeah, and isn't that great? Uh, we need more of that. And, you know, I would just make a, a statement. But I used my seat at the table and that's something I had to learn. Firstly, I sat there and I would be a little bit meek um, and I wouldn't comment. But I, I learned how to how to speak up appropriately and how to take the floor. Uh, and it took a lot of confidence um, to do that. Growing up um, with a father in the military, I, I didn't have a lot of that confidence in, internally. And so I had to learn how to bring that up in, in, inside me. And learning to be um, comfortable in the uncomfortable. And I have that each and every day. I, I almost have it as a mantra now that if I'm not uncomfortable in any given day, that I'm not pushing forward. Um, so I try to be uncomfortable, which is not easy. Um, finding your balance. There's a lot of sacrifice that we need to make as mothers, as sisters, as daughters, as um, mentors, as leaders, and, and we do need to sacrifice. But um, my, my um, thought to you is to choose what to sacrifice and, and when to sacrifice it. Um, and I had a child quite late um, in life and, and um, my husband and I had a conversation and said, we don't, we don't want to not experiencing have, you know, having children. And so I did take a step back and, and stepped away to, to have a child and what a wonderful experience. Um, it did set me back, I have to say, um, for, for a year or so, um, but it well and truly worth it. And, and I think I learned from that is to, um, you know, when to sacrifice and when to, when to give away for the things you actually truly want um, through your journey. One of the things that I think has, has set um, me apart, and I say this with the most humble uh, voice, is I truly care about people. Um, and I care about um, the, the surgeons that we serve every day. I care about my team. Um, and I approach some very, very difficult and challenging and conflicting situations with care. Um, because at the end of the day, the way I view it is, is, is someone has a, a reason for why they're acting the way they are or a situation has arisen the way it is. And if I approach something with care, you can have a really open and candid conversation um, as long as you care about um, people. And that's been something for me that is, is really important. And, and understanding where people are coming from and seeing the whole person um, has been really beneficial for me to understand um, even what a lot of my, my male colleagues are going through as well. And they do have conflicts. They're just, a lot of them are not allowed to show it. And that's what's been a, a very big learning for, for me. And you just have to ask and, and they will share that experience. Be open and curious. Um, and I also thought I had to prove, prove myself and still to this day, I feel like I have to prove myself. It's probably something that I need to learn. I asked my boss uh, what he saw in me and, and he said to me, sometimes you self-reflect, Annie, just a little bit too much, but then you do move on. Um, and I think that's something I've learned, um, but I'm still trying to prove myself uh, each and every each and every day, which is, which is something I, I'll strive to, to do. But I wanted to share with you because this is something that um, many of you may or may not take advantage of each and every day. And Arthrex, the, the company I work for, I'm very proud to work in the medical device industry. Um, I chose this as an industry when I, um, when I finished my science degree because it does give back and it does support um, procedures that are going on each and every day around the world. Um, and it is part of the, the um, healthcare industry. Uh, there's a lot that organisations do each and every day that I want you to be aware of that you can tap into um, and we want to be part of advancing um, what um, the Asia-Pacific Orthopaedic Association is, is objectives and is trying to achieve and also what WAVES is trying to, to achieve um, because our goal that we wake up each and every day is to help you treat your patients better and that's really important to us and our, we're a private organisation and our founder and, and owner um, wakes up to this each and every day. 
Um, this is just a footprint of what Arthrex does. We're not one of the really big orthopaedic firms. We're, we're more focused in, in minimally invasive. The, the organisation actually started at the Munich Olympics in, in 1972, um, so as old as I am. Um, but it was all about how athletes um, com competing at a high level of sport could actually have surgery that was more minimally invasive and what tools and instruments did they need in order to do that. And that's how Arthrex was born. Um, and, and it's just grown from there. And the foundation of it is around innovation, uh, education um, and support um, of surgeons each and every day. But I wanted to share this with you because the industry and Arthrex does support you each and every day. And there's access you can have to education and training courses that are run by industry. Um, there's many of these that happen not just by Arthrex, but by a lot of organisations um, in the orthopaedic space and in the wider um, medical device space. These are usually published or, or if not, you can find out about them. Um, but we, we offer a lot of uh, education our, at Arthrex. Our education is run by an orthopaedic surgeon in the US. Uh, in Asia Pacific, it's run by a physician's assistant. And we're actually just looking at um, bringing an orthopaedic surgeon in from the US to run our Australian medical education team. So very experienced um, team here supporting the use of devices in a safe and effective way each and every day. Compliance is a big part of what we do. We want to make sure that we support you in your interactions in the right way and that you make the right decisions for, for your patients and, and the um, presentations that you have every day. We look around a lot of regulations and access, and, and that's important to us that you can access the products that you need. And sometimes this is difficult for us as well. There's a lot of hurdles for us to bring products to, to markets around the world. But the other part is research, um, and a lot of organisations need research around their products to be able to launch them. And there's a lot of research that goes on each and every day that companies um, are involved in um, that you can have access to if research is something that you're interested in. And so I wanted to put this down, down the bottom here to just give you a, 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 something that's available to you is orthopedia.com. You can go on there. There's videos. There's, um, there's um, case studies of all things across orthopedics um, that you can access and, and get educated on. Um, you can also go onto arthrex.com and, and find out more about um, what Arthrex can offer. We also have lab-based training so that you can, in a very safe environment, um, learn to do a procedure or a new innovative way um, so there's a lot of resources out there to, to have access to, and these are only the ones that, that Arthrex has. As I mentioned, a lot of companies uh, have these. So I wanted to, to end on saying um, we live our mission every day, which is to help surgeons treat their patients better, and we're very focused on, on that um, and the patient um, that, is, that is affected um, with this surgery to, to improve their life. And it's something that I'm very proud to, to support and support you each and every day. So I will, uh, I will end on that note and say thank you very much for, for having me and, and for allowing me to share my, my career and what I've learned along the way. Thanks very much, Annie. That was really um, enjoyable. And I, I think um, probably particularly for the female orthopaedic surgeons online, which is probably most of the people online, um, <laughs> The story around being often the only woman in the room is one that rings true for many of us or the only female in the unit. And yeah. um, and I, I wonder if we could just explore a little bit. You also, around, um, it was around power really, you talked about making the decisions and taking risks and making really active decisions. I think a lot of us um, don't feel the power in the room. How... Um, how is it, was it through mentoring that you felt that ability to step up and take the risk or what were the sort of drivers for you that might be able to help us? Yeah, I, I have to say I stumbled a lot because I, I did make some mistakes. I can tell you pounding the fist on the table doesn't actually work. <laughs> Um, but what I what I found was having pre conversations with with trusted people, so having those that relationship base. Um, and having a, a, an advocate at the table with you dramatically helped. So what they would do is um, if I present an idea, they would plus my idea or they would support my idea straight away and then it would get the floor and then I would have the opportunity to share that further. Uh, and that was big. It took a lot of extra work, I have to say, um, and, uh, it, but, it, but it definitely did help, help me and I had to pick my battles. I really had to pick my battles is what what were the passionate things I wanted to be about. So, but being part of the the women's networks in my organization, 
I'm very passionate. I do speak out a lot. I've got a little, a little bit more as I was going through my career with my title. Now I can throw a little bit more weight around. Um, and when we're doing panels, I was sharing with you, um, Annette, when we're doing panels now, I'm, I'm fighting very, very hard to have a diverse slate. Um, and I, I don't want, um, you know, no no female um, on a panel. And uh, so when Arthrex has done their education in Australia, we've we've had a minimum of two. And I'm, I'm trying to build that up to be more uh, females on the panellists. And this is where we can help each other. But it is it is having those advocates. And, and that really helped me. Yeah, I think that that's um, really helpful. Um, and just further to power, did you, um, did people hand it to you? You're like, I think we have also an expectation if we behave well and we're pleasant enough, eventually someone will recognise our good worth and give us the responsibility and power that comes with it. Or is it something that you just have to take? Yeah, um, being nice doesn't help, but being respected does, and I and I think it's just having a strong strong voice. So, um, for for me, it's about that caring nature, um, as as opposed to being nice. Um, but then having your answers, you know, having your situation backed, um, and and that's where it's come from me from that 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 power situation is um, a an advocate, and and then sharing your voice with the strength, and and just having that confidence we we sometimes don't have the confidence um in the room to, to speak up and state it um the other feedback my boss gave me before I stepped in here is I do actually point out the elephant in the room but I actually say I'm going to point out the elephant in the room and it might be we need more females on this panel and and I'll just say it and um I, I think I've I've gotten to a position where I can say that but working up I had to be brave to say that and some people would say to me later oh that was really brave of you to say that um, and, it, and it paved the way, but you do have to build the confidence. <laughs> you do, um, and it's it's not easy. Um, and I was knocked back many many a time, which I'm sure a lot of you have experienced. I, I was knocked. I was knocked back um, in in many in many a case. Um, but I just had to keep persevering. Yeah, I think that probably varies a lot with the cultures across um, this group as well. Um, it's it's quite a broad spread from. Um, do we include the Philippines? I think we go to sort of Philippines, Australia, right across Asia and into Turkey. Um, so there's a really broad cross-section of cultures um, that we're trying to deal with, mostly patriarchal, I have to say. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I've I've experienced that going up into to Asia Pacific and being a visitor helps a, a lot. Um, and I know you've experienced this, Annette, as well, being a visitor in um with a title definitely helps you across a lot of those cultures um and um it's, we've still got a lot of work to do in australia as well it's a little bit easier in australia but i think we've still got a lot of work to do and i'm hoping in australia now we have three or four uh ladies that head up medical device organizations and we're trying to change the voice uh here to to ensure that um we have a good representation hmm. Thank you. Is anyone else on the panel got any questions for Annie? Or yeah, I think I've... Emel has typed in something. What is the ratio of female oh. orthopedics in research development and technology departments? And what are your suggestions to increase the representation of women in this area? Uh, do you observe any differences between genders and orthopedic in terms of getting industrial support? And do you think female orthos receive fewer consulting and royalty payments from the industry? Yes, ab absolutely, and and I think that's um that's more in in sort of a little bit of history um that has come through that a lot of the projects that are put on the table have come through um from from male colleagues um but I do in research and and technology in the research and development departments um in the US it's starting to become more female oriented especially as you get into more software type devices. But we're also seeing because the at universities the the gender balance in STEM classes um, and engineering is changing. So you are seeing more of those female engineers come through. A lot of them do sit in the marketing um, roles um, and or uh, other business roles. But you are starting to see that change. Um, with when it comes to to research and product design, um, really my my view of it is any idea is a good idea, and you go through a a um, a process and every company will have their process. So put the projects in, ask the question. Um, and I get asked questions each and every day and every general manager in each of your countries will get asked those questions. So put them forward if you've got an idea and not every idea gets up. 
Um, but they're definitely, if you put your ideas forward and they're backed with research, um, they will definitely be put in. And companies need the research as well. So companies publish the research that they're looking for. So you can become um, part of that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Producer, would you like to take back? Over? Yes, so I just one very, very quick question from me before because it's almost the uh, time for the panel discussion. Very quick question for me. When you say that uh, when someone tells you that you're my role model and you feel a heavy sense of responsibility, uh, what's the best way to deal with it? Be conscious, be intentional and, and be conscious of, um, of what you're doing. And, and that's, um, that's something that probably changed for me about 10 years ago is to, to be very intentional about um, what I'm doing and what I'm saying and, and what I'm supporting. So I'm very, very intentional with that now. Yes, thank you. That was absolutely fabulous to have you with us and great insights. And I mean, I think very, very inspiring talk. And, uh, Not a problem. If anyone has any I questions, think... reach out. Please reach out. Yeah, sure. yeah thank we you, hope Annie. you will be continuing our relationship with the waves in future too, because we, I think you. we will, I will learn from to. you. <laughs> I'd love to. Thank you. We'd love to. Yes, and um, we, we have a fabulous panel now and uh, may I, I think I'll put on the slides and I'll request Emel to moderate this part of today's webinar and our young uh, Sema and uh, Chasnal to do the introductions. So again, I will screen share. Yes. Yes. Yes, Can everyone see this? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, welcome to this special webinar celebrating International Women's Day, uh, dedicated to all incredible women orthopedic surgeons out there. Today, we come together to recognize and celebrate the remarkable achievements of women in the field of orthopedic surgery and to discuss the unique challenges that women face in this male-dominated profession. We have an amazing lineup of panelists who will share their experiences, insights, and advice on how to overcome these challenges and thrive as women orthopedic surgeons. We hope this webinar will provide you with valuable knowledge, networking opportunities, and a chance to connect with other women in orthopedic surgery. Thank you for taking time to join us, and we hope you enjoy the presentation and discussions. And let's know these panelists, and Sema and Chasanal, please, could you introduce? Hello, uh, and welcome, everyone. I am Sema Ertan from Istanbul. I work as an uh, orthopedic surgeon in Istanbul. I would like to start with introducing our first panelist, uh, Dr. Ayşe Musa. She is an orthopedic surgeon from Saudi Arabia, currently working as senior surgeon in King Fahd Hospital uh, in Jeddah. She was graduated medicine from Tabia University in Medina in 2013. Then she completed her orthopedic uh, surgery residency in Jeddah in 2020. Uh, she had been working voluntarily in Mecca, Medina, Riyadh from 2010 to present. Also, she had been worked in Malaysia University Hand Surgery Department in 2019. Now she's performing her medical and academic studies in King Fahd General Hospital from 2021 until present. Uh, welcome, Dr. Aisha Musa, I'd like to say. And our second panelist, is Dr. Melanie uh, Amosoria from Sri Lanka. She's a hand and wrist surgeon from Sri Lanka, and she's the first woman to be an orthopedic surgeon in her country. Uh, after her, uh, after following her residency and training in Sri Lanka, then she completed the International Surgical Training Fellowship in United Kingdom. Uh, she also completed the Australian Orthopedic Association Fellowship in Hand and Wrist, wrist uh, Surgery and St. Vincent Hospital, Melbourne, and a Clinical and Research Fellowship in Upper Limb Surgery at uh, Flinders Medical Center, uh, South Australia. She was awarded the Asia Pacific Wrist Traveling Fellowship in 2019 and Australian Federation of University Women's Centenary Scholarship in 2022. 
also Flanders University Research Scholarship in 2023. Melanie is currently in the final year of her PhD in Wirst Biomechanics at the Flanders University in South Australia. And uh, she has published many peer-reviewed research papers and book chapters and delivered many specific uh, scientific presentations at international meetings, including invited presentations. She was the keynote speaker at the scientific sessions of the Sri Lankan hand surgery in 2022. Uh, she's a passionate about teaching junior colleagues and continue to teach medical and aligned health studies at Flinders University at the Adelaide University, South Australia. Welcome, Dr. Melanie. And uh, I would like to give the word to Chesana. Yeah, so greetings from India. And I'm Dr. Shashnal, pediatric surgeon. And I am very glad to be part of this International Women's Day webinar from APOA Waves. And I'd like to welcome Dr. Asita Ari. She is a hip and knee arthroplasty surgeon at Sentosa Hospital, Indonesia. And uh, she is the chief of chair of Connection, the APO in the newsletter, the GIST. And recently she has launched a wonderful uh, edition, I mean, on the International Women's Day special. She is a very active person in the Asia Pacific Arthroplasty Society and has been an AO trauma instructor as well. So welcome Azita for this uh, on the panel. And next we have is Dr. Karen Vista. Yeah, so Karen is an assistant professor at uh, Mangalore and currently she specializing in she specializes in arthroscopy and sports medicine. And she has nine years of experience post-residency. She's one of the prize winners for the APOA Waves essay that is Crack the Code Innovation for Gender Equal Future. So welcome, Karen, on the panel. And now I ask Dr. ML to take yes, the panel discussion. Thank you, Chisanel. Yeah. Uh, we're waiting for the questions. While waiting, I would like to ask all of you, Aisha, Melanie, Azeta, and Karen, uh, assuming all genders are equal, equally represented during medical faculty in your country, uh, how is the population of women orthopedists in your country compared to when uh, men uh, colleagues? And is there any culture uh, or country specific point that blocks women from choosing or continuing a career uh, a career as orthopedic surgeons? Yes, hello. Um, I'm glad to be here. It's my pleasure to be uh, part of this wonderful team. Um, my name is Aisha Musa and uh, um, I'm working as a senior registrar in King Fahad General Hospital in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Um, regarding um, our role as a female orthopedic surgeon, um, to be honest, it's um, still um, a male dominant specialty in my country, although the uh, number of uh, women in this field is increasing according to the previous years. So, um, it's challenging and um, um, to be honest, uh, it's challenging at the, uh, at the personal level. But from my point of view, I've, uh, I'm so lucky person uh, um, to have a very supportive colleagues and mentors and leaders in my field. Um, so I would say it was a, a positive experience for me um, on a personal level. Thank you. And Melanie? Um, yes, uh, so my experience is pretty similar. So when I was in medical student studies about 20 years ago, well, 15 years ago, um, uh, the, the, the gender balance was like 50-50 in med school, so 50% or 51 to 2% are girls. But when it comes to orthopedics, so I'm still unfortunately the only uh, woman to do orthopedics in the country. It's partly cultural. I think the bigger the the bigger picture is that uh, more than cultural, it's the it's the the support you have for orthopedics in general. For example, Sri Lanka is a country with a twenty one million uh, twenty to twenty one million uh, population. 
the number of orthopedic surgeons we have in the country is like 120. So it's uh, orthopedic training massively is a service uh, service uh, commitment rather than a training itself. So, uh, but, and uh, so if, you if you're choosing orthopedics, the commitment is that you need to do like all seven day on calls. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a big commitment. Whereas the cultural part of it is like, there's nothing blocking women doing orthopedics. Like there's not, like people would love to see a surgeon, a, a, a lady surgeon, but then the role expected from you as a mother, as a woman is, is different in that culture. And we as women sort of try to fit into that, believe it, it's our job to have three hot meals so, uh, prepared for the husband and the, the kids. So it's difficult to juggle those two roles, the, com the service commitment that is, that is needed from an orthopedic uh, surgical career, and also uh, your role as a mother or a wife in that particular culture. So that's my personal experience. Thank you, Melanie. And Azita, what do you Hi, think? Thank you. Hi, thank you for inviting me, Hilda Rijata, and uh, thank you, Romeo, for the question. So we have a similar um, situation, actually, because we're living in the same area. Asian, Asian uh, female is demanding a family um, process, a woman roles, and also as a mother. So we have to, you know, we have to be a mother in uh, the other side and also be a professional orthopedic surgeon in the other side. So it's not about blocking, uh, it's about the challenges that we face in the real life in Asia country, particularly in Indonesia. But uh, in my own um, in my own experience, uh, I'm lucky that uh, I live in a family who really support the education. So there's no difference with my uh, brother, so I can go for uh, the next level of education. But in some area in Indonesia, there's a still a stigma that uh, women's only for um, you know for, for only for from uh, bed and from kitchens, you know, to serve the family rather than to uh, be uh, more professionals. The one in our country, we have. In 2022, we have data that's only 71 female orthopedic surgeons compared with the male, uh, compared with all the population of the orthopedic surgeon is nearly 1,400. So it's less than 1% orthopedic surgeon in Indonesia. I think it's my, uh, this, our situation. Mm -hmm. And do you also, uh, Azita, observe that there is an exponential increase increase in the ratio of women choosing orthopedic surgery in the last few years? Because we observe this in Turkey. Yeah, well, uh, unfortunately, I don't have exact data, but I can see now uh, residents more female rather than my uh, rather than my my time in two thousand. 2010. I believe it's a more more female residents now, mm. rather than my experience in 2010. Maybe because uh, in the in one department at that time, so only three 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 female sergeants there, and I experienced the one and only sergeant when my two seniors uh, uh, finished the residency. So I'm the only one resident for three years, but nowadays I found maybe three or five. Uh, Residents per per year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. it is increasing. Yeah, thank you. And Kara, what would you say? So my my situation is com comparatively similar to um, the other four uh, three panelists. Uh, I come from a very conservative state, so um, them accepting of a woman as a surgeon, let alone an orthopedic surgeon, is still not uh, very forthcoming. But yes, the patients, they are very forthcoming when they, when they ask, when they request that they want a woman surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon. Um, I'm also quite lucky. Yes, I do have a very encouraging team. Uh, so that benefits me as well, even though my state is very conservative. And, and when I did uh, orthopedics, which was in 2010, uh, I was like a one-off. There was only one probably in three years, a woman representing orthopedics. 
Whereas now, fast forward to 2023, uh, there are three women per year that are taken as orthopedic residents. So there is quite a change in overall, but it's a very slow change, yes. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Azita, uh, you're interested in uh, dealing with adult reconstruction, trauma, and sports uh, arthroscopy. And uh, why do we see fewer women in some subspecialties such as arthroplasty and spine? Uh, how is your feedback? Do you have any challenges as an arthroplasty surgeon, as a woman? Yes, well, that's, actually, there's no really obstacle with, if you really love it. So it's uh, depend on the female itself uh, want to choose what specialty that she really want to improve for the rest of her life. Because subs when you once you choose the subspecialty, then you will concern for the rest of the life for that field. Okay, I think there is no specific um, obstacles. But I talk and chat with uh, Arnett. Is there any chance for uh, tool designs for uh, women? So like in the sport, we have specific sport here for diving female is different with the male female or golf stick female is different with the male stick female. So uh, if we have, a, for example, if we have a lighter and more handy and so more ergonomic for females, it's more encouraging female surgeon or female resident to enter the the arthroscopy or enter the, the arthroplasty because we see that it's a very demanding physical job to be an arth arthroplasty, especially for a hip. So when when I see the the the, the first time, oh my God, it's a, the tool is too big to for, for my small hand. So uh, maybe uh, someday we can have a specific tool for ladies. Okay, and uh, Arnett, I wonder, uh, and also Azeta wonders, do you have research or more, uh, on more handy tools for women so the female surgeon can work more ergonomic? Yeah. Yeah, As it's, it's interesting um, if you say that because um, I was part of the design team on orthopedic power tools for a number of years. Um, and it's it, there's so many inputs that go in because you need a certain amount of power and torque to be able to read. Mm. Um, and so there's a certain size that needs to come, come into it. Um, but it was something that we were asking the question about as technology was getting smaller but more powerful, you could actually design yes. it in a more ergonomic, yeah. ergonomic way. Um, but there are some power tools that, that are a little bit smaller that are getting more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, that you can look into, but it's it's also um, some of the instruments with the grip span and and things like that, yeah. that do get looked into. So we do look at that and the and the weight, but it, it is a ratio with the power and torque that you need as well. And, and so it, there is a there is difficulty, but I completely understand it because you do. Um, it is difficult sometimes, even as me, when I was the head of marketing, trying to say that I, I can't hold these. <laughs> so, how is anybody else like me supposed to hold these? And the engineer is like, well, I can't make it any smaller because we need that much power. So it's it's one of those trade-offs, but it's something that I think that we need to ask the question more as technology gets better and better. So it's, a good, it's, a, it's a good opportunity, I think. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Karen, uh... I would like to ask, first of all, uh, thank you, your essay that you got second prize was wonderful and it was about your efforts and diligence uh, to treat a syndromic patient, a syndromic girl. And there are some papers that say female patients fare worse with male surgeons and women having surgery get better results if their surgeon is a woman. And uh, there are liter this literature also says that women patients are 15% greater odds of worse outcome post-op and 32% increased risk of that and 16% increase in major complications if their surgeon is a man. And what is your observation? What do you think about these publications? Well, this the word better is like a little dangerous adjective. I won't say uh, we're better. I would say we're at par or on par with um, with our male counter, uh, counterparts. Um, yes, I would to some extent agree. We have lesser complications. Uh, we have we take less time. We're more accurate. Sometimes we take more time 
uh, well, at least my male counterparts would say that. But I think what we deliver at the end, uh, the post -out outcome, it's much better, more efficient. Uh, patient satisfaction as well overall is way, way better. Um, so in that, in that way, yes, patient satisfaction outcome, I would say is good with both men and women. We are on par, but on par with them. Uh, the quality uh, of our surgeries, much better, I would say, yes. Thank you. And Aisha, uh, in the light of this literature, do you think is there any difference in the trust of the patient according to the gender of the surgeon? And does the trust of the patient in a woman orthopedic surgeon differs according to the patient's gender? It's funny enough you uh, you you asked me this question because um, just a couple of days ago I was just thinking about this same question uh, because I have a lot of also male patients now normally the basic uh, outlook or the view amongst our counterparts and colleagues is that if I'm a woman then women will also flutter towards me because a woman sees another woman they'll trust more but funny enough I have also a large number of male patients who put their trust in me. So I think, yes, the gender also plays a major role because overall, we not only, as a woman, we not only see it from a doctor or a surgeon point of view, we also see it from some of us from a wife point of view, a mother point of view, a daughter point of view. Like I think Arnette mentioned also in her talk that these there are so many things that culminate that we take into account for, which maybe as our a male surgeon does not, so yes, overall, I think the gender plays also some part, some role in treating the patients and also having them very satisfied after the surgery. Thank yes. you. I, and I uh -huh. Sorry. Good. Yes, Karen. Sorry. sorry. Yeah, I just recently, uh, I did one uh, scopy uh, for a meniscal tear for one of the patients. And in fact, she said this to me, and that's what got me thinking on this question. Does the role a, a woman or as a woman orthopedic surgeon do we, uh, are we, uh, well, in terms of satisfaction and outcome, does it change the patient, how they look at us, it, whether it's a male patient or a female patient? And she actually made the statement saying that, um, I came to you, I fought for, to come, for, come to you. There were options, there were better people, your male, the male surgeons, some better orthopedic male counterparts. Mm -hmm. But I came to you because I knew uh, you would look at me as in total, not only as your patient, but also um, in terms of recovery and how I would get back to being the wife, the mother, the daughter, the expectations from societies and from the family, you would look into all of that in total. So yes. Thank you. And Aisha, how is your observations about it? Um, I believe that being confident will be um, reflected on the a surgeon a patient relationship. So uh, no matter what, what is the gender of the patient. So um, confidence is the key, number one. And the second is, um, as um, we mentioned earlier, that uh, yes, sometimes uh, being compassionate and the plan of care you're giving to the patient uh, will give you like extra credit and uh, you will be like more preferred to them than uh, the other main colleagues. So yes, I agree. Thank you, thank you. And uh, Melanie, uh, as a member of fellowship committees of Asia Pacific Risk Association, and as a research fellowship in upper limb surgery in Australia, uh, could you mention some fellowship opportunities for women and what are the match rate or if there is any uh, and chosen specialties for women for fellowship. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not actually. Um, so the, there are multiple organizations which offer fellowships. Like, if, like if you're um, I'm a hand surgeon. So if you're a hand and wrist surgeon, Asia Pacific Wrist uh, Fellowship is there. And if you're a sports and arthroscopic surgeons, there's this is the COS organization which offers fellowships. And um, and also International Wrist Arthroscopy Association, they do have fellowship, but these are actually regardless of the gender, you can apply to any of those. I think it's um, I don't think they're specifically they um, uh, um, they specifically um, uh, prefer women or otherwise, uh, but 
you just have to, um, I think in any other op, um, orthopedic uh, subspecialty organizations, they do have these fellowships regardless of the gender, which you can apply to. Uh, spe uh, specific uh, fellowships are for women. I'm actually not too um, uh, not aware of that. Uh, but if you if someone can, else can add to that, that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, I wonder if, uh, for all of you, uh, do you have uh, any inspiration or uh, do you have any mentor uh, at any point in your career? Mm, maybe Melanie. Yes. Uh, yeah, Aisha. Yes. Beginning yes. with you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, yes, I've uh, so many uh, special mentors uh, along the journey. Um, I've been lucky to have um, a great mentor. I've been told that to beat the system, you have to be better than the system. And this sentence, it was like a reminder for me every time I like um, hesitant or I feel like, I, like um, I'm not enough or like, uh, whatever like negative feelings I'm having. So uh, whenever I, rem uh, I uh, remember his uh, uh, words, so just like, yes, uh, I can do it. Uh, I get myself back together. And um, yeah, uh, I'm lucky to have um, a great mentors along the journey. Thank you. And Azita, what do you think of it? Yeah, I'm agree. I'm mentoring and... Um... Leading is uh, very important and also connections is very important for uh, our career. Without them, without their um, guidance, we cannot reach uh, this kind of um, uh, positions, I think. That's really important. Thank you. And uh, Karen, I wonder uh, which is more important, uh, having a mentor or having a sponsor for you to speak for you for to name you for uh, to put your name forward for special projects or for promotions that's like a double edged sword chris earlier on in my career i was very fortunate to have a mentor who also was my um mbbs my undergraduate anatomy teacher and i tell all my students this i was very lucky to have him early on because Early on in your career, you're not thinking about where can I go, what can I do, but you're rather building your confidence. You're trying to um, ascertain the fact that, yes, I am an orthopedician. I'm a woman orthopedician. I can do this for the next you know, 40, 50 years of my life. I love what I do. I'm not, uh, I'm not insecure. I'm not incompetent. I'm not less than anyone else. So early on in your career, you need a mentor like that, a very secure man who, and a surgeon, an orthopedic surgeon or a surgeon as such, to tell you, yes, you can do this. You have that inside of you if you love what you do. Later on in your career, you might need a sponsor uh, because you need to sustain. It's not so easy or later on in life because um, there are a lot of factors. Some for some, it's marriage, it's family, balancing that. For the rest of us who are, are not, maybe I would say not entered into family life, the rest of us, it is, especially in a place like India, you need someone uh, where men and male domination is uh, at the forefront. You need someone to say, yes, this is a person who's capable, who can do it, who can speak for you who can say, yes, we are, we can depend on her to deliver just as a, a good job, a good outcome as one, any one of us. So yes, later on in your career, and I'm experiencing that actually at the moment, that you need that kind of help and that kind of uh, positivity later on in your career, yes. So it's a double-edged sword, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we have a few minutes just about to finish, I guess. And is there any questions from, uh, I can't see any questions from the audience. Is there any questions from us? So just for closing question, I just want to ask Melanie, uh, what do we need to do to engage and inspire male advocates? <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's a bit of a tricky question. Uh, well, um, yeah, I think uh, most of the most 
I mean, I think the trend now towards most of the male colleagues are aware and are supportive. I think it's a generational thing. So like previous generations, like few decades ago, people who have trained in orthopedics have not seen women. So if you have not seen women orthopedic surgeons, they're inherently like, it's natural for them to doubt it. So when I went to orthopedics, there have a lot of older um, um, uh, orthopedic surgeons who were doubting a woman's capacity to get into this field. Um, so I think the the uh, one thing that I did, I had to do as a the, the first person who was going through that pathway is this, just, just work hard and persevere to the point that they believe. Like, you know, I don't think like everyone has to do that. Like there should be, a, there should be women to get to where they want. But like when you do it as a first person, it just takes perseverance, hard work, until you change their attitudes. That's one way of doing that. You have an example, all right, there's this woman who has done this so that the men who are in power believes that women can do that. So like, if you look at Annette, who was the president of Australian Orthopedic Association, we all look up to her and all the, all the, the regardless of the gender, everybody looks up to her and see if Annette can do that, others can do that too. So I think that's important. Um, second thing is uh, awareness and, and awareness and discussion and promoting uh, this trend so that they're consciously aware. All right. So this is a female trainee. She is also capable of doing that. I do have to invest my time and my skills in training her to the same extent that I invest my time on a male trainee. So it's more awareness. So the last layer of that, as, as I see, it's coming into the, the systems. So it's built in systems for like, for example, in the research space. Uh, so your grant application doesn't go through if there's no diversity in your uh, research uh, team. So if that's the last layer um, to, um, to build that into systems. So it's, it's, it's a norm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, one more for- Thank you. Yes, for yeah, Dr. Jata, as a chair section of women, of women or to uh, able sections, um, I think it's a good idea if we have an opportunity for fellowship program for female orthopedics, so they can uh, traveling fellow. It's like not a full fellowship. It's like just like traveling fellowship. So the fem the young female can uh, visit a prominent surgeon, for example, Annette, for example, you, and then have a role models to be uh, have a wider uh, yeah, perspective about the yes. female outside the country. Yes, that's an excellent uh, idea. And it's been there uh, in all our minds, in fact, from the inception uh, last to last year when Annette proposed to have this section in APOA. I think but this was one of the main things uh, that she wanted to start out with. And then even we were drafting the constitution and uh, objectives along with Tanya, who I'm really, really missing today. Um, we do have this in our mind and we are thinking of doing um, something along those lines, uh, hopefully in future. Uh, and it just writes down, there is an Asian Australian traveling fellowship, uh, but probably in Dina Bayans because of the uh, COVID pandemic. Um, there is uh, a bit of a talk going on in the APOA at the moment of linking, cross-linking all the chapters and their fellowship opportunities. And uh, probably, hopefully, this year we may come out with something if, if yeah, all goes well. Hopefully. hopefully. And uh, from what I see, I think, you know, uh, Waves uh, started uh, last year with the idea of just really connecting uh, each other and supporting each other in this. Uh, we've had representation from Japan, uh, uh, Saudi also last year, and uh, Korea. And this year we've had engagement now from uh, Sri Lanka, India, uh, again, Saudi uh, and uh, Indonesia. So, uh, you know, more representation from uh, engaging as many countries as possible across the Asia Pacific. I'm sure there are still countries which we don't even know whether an orthopedic surgeon exists, uh, a female orthopedic surgeon exists. Say, for example, yeah. Vietnam, Cambodia. So we all need to really network together and work more closely to build up this database. And when we say we are you know, lifting as we rise and marching forwards, I think at the moment we are just a ripple. 
you know, we just put a drop in the ocean and we just started making a stir and it needs to build up and it's really the waves need to, the tide needs to rise really high and keep going. You know, I think it's uh, what we'll use, I think, from Annie Stock is uh, doing a walk with the mentors. So across countries, obviously, you can't really do a walk, but we could do something like a digital, you know, sparing time and having a mentor mentee pair. And uh, since the pandemic has uh, brought us together uh, in the digital way, yeah, what Annette writes is like we can become a gentle tsunami. Yes, that that would definitely be the way forward for all of us. And uh, may I request Erica now to do the vote of thanks? All right, it is an honor for me to be here with everybody at this wonderful event. On behalf of my colleagues and the entire executive members of the APO Waves, I want to thank our keynote speakers, Dr. Shalimar Abdullah from Malaysia and Ms. Annie Arnett from Australia, the panelists, Dr. Melanie from Sri Lanka, Dr. Azeta from Indonesia, Dr. Karen from India, and Dr. Aisha from Saudi for sharing the amazing experience with us today. I also extend our gratitude to Orto TV, especially Dr. Niraj and Dr. Ashok for working hard for the past few days to make this webinar successful. We also would like to welcome everybody to join WAVES by sending your application to apoawaves at gmail.com. Finally, with these warm words, we may move to the end of today's webinar Happy International Women's Day and see you next time. Yes. And Happy we'll International Women's one, Day. One, one line yeah. over there saying that up to 31st of March, the membership is free. So please <laughs> encourage all your country fellow, fellow women to join up with APOA. Thank you, everyone. It's been yeah. really Perhaps great to may. have you. Um, so, let's, let's all switch on picture. our cameras. Chasna, also, can you switch on your camera for a lovely final screenshot? Now, I think probably she may not be able to do that from the <laughs> aircraft. So, <laughs> oh, there she is. Okay, there she is. There she is. All right. Say cheese, everyone. <laughs>Thank you all. It was really good. Thank you. It was really good. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Nice I to meet you on. personally, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Very nice. I didn't record. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend.